Hey, good morning and happy Easter Arsenal. Welcome to our online experience. Today, we're gonna hear a message from Pastor Chad and some worship from the Arsenal Band. Before that, why don't you go ahead and invite somebody to come to church with you on this Easter. Just share this video and invite them and chat with them and hop in the chat yourself. Let us know who's here, who's watching with you. We'd love to chat with you, love to talk with you. Again, happy Easter, Arsenal Band, take us away. Your love is a 
Hey, thanks so much for singing along. Thank you, Arsenal Band. We want to stay connected with you as much as possible. The best way to do that is to just text this number right here, and that will come directly to me and to Pastor Chad. Just text that as you normally would if you were texting us or texting a friend. Um, That's us. We want to stay connected. We want to chat with you. We want to know what's going on in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Text us, hang out with us. We we love you and we want to be here for you. We want to be connected with you. Also, hey, today we're having an Easter morning service online. Next week, we'll be back to our normal Monday evening time slot at 7 p.m. So we hope to see you there if you're an online watcher, Monday evenings. And we know that that doesn't work well for everybody. So you can always re-watch. And when you comment, we'll still see it and we can still chat with you. And if you need to chat also, like, don't forget, you can text that number. We just we just want to stay connected with you, right? Um, 
Also, if you want to support the Arsenal financially, we we live and survive off of, you know, the support of the Arsenal family. So thank you so much for doing that. You can do that multiple ways by uh, texting to give. You can give through our Facebook or our not Facebook, our uh, our website. And you can also give through our app. So Thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate everything that that comes in. And and man, we love you, Arsenal family. And right now, Pastor Chad has an Easter message just for you. So take it away, Pastor Chad. It was early in the morning on the third day after Jesus had been crucified. The women closest to him in his life, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, Jesus' mother, made their way to the tomb where they'd laid Jesus to rest. They went with spices that they'd prepared to anoint his body, as was the tradition in Jewish law. When they arrived to the tomb, though, the stone that had covered the entrance to the tomb, had been rolled away. In shock, they they walked into the tomb and noticed that the body of Jesus was not there. Scripture says that, confused and perplexed, they wondered what had happened when two men, glowing like lightning, showed up in the tomb. And the women fell to their faces As the men asked them, who do you search for? The women, confused, said, we we, we search for our Lord, but we don't know where he is. And the men responded with a question. Why do you search for the living among the dead? He is alive. He is risen. What a fascinating question, right? Especially for a group of women that showed up there at a tomb that they'd laid their friend, their son, their their Lord to rest after watching him die a brutal death on the cross. What a fascinating question to be asked. Why do you search for the living among the dead? They must have thought, like, well, no, 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 we're we're looking for Jesus. He's dead. We're searching for the dead among the dead. And these men said, no, he's not here. He he is risen. They, They ran back. It says, after hearing this, they ran back to the disciples, to... These men that had done life with Jesus for three years, and they they told these men what what had happened. Scripture says that, I love in John's gospel, it says that Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved, which as John's writing this, that's John, took off running to the tomb. In John, it's in John 20, you see, it says that the Peter and the, the disciple that Jesus loved took off running to the tomb. They were together when they began, but the disciple that Jesus loved got there first. And then Peter showed up a little bit later. But it says that the disciple that Jesus loved, when he got there, he ran to the tomb. And in John 20, verse 8, it says this, he saw the linen cloth lying there in in the tomb, and it, it says that he believed. It says, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in. And after one look, he believed. For until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures that prophesied that he was destined to rise from the dead. It says in verse 10, puzzled, Peter and the other disciple then left and went back to their homes. You have to understand that for those that are closest to Jesus, They they were young Jews. They believed in the Messiah. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one that would lead them out of oppression. He was the one that would 
lead them into their own land out of the rule of the Romans, that they, they would step into this land where they would be free and they could live. They had believed and, and even held the prophecies of the Old Testament as the belief that being out of their own land in Israel, being ruled or oppressed under another government's rule was a symbol of death. When they looked at prophecy, the, these, these followers of Jesus, the closest to him, ha- had seen Israel being under the rule of Rome as death and life of the prophecy stepping into life was this promise of one day having their circumstances changed and being led into freedom where they could prosper in the existence in in their own land. Governed by Jews, not some oppressive government, but themselves. that They believed that death was being under others' rule and life would be their own land in their own kingdom. Even the followers of Jesus, when they looked at this, they they didn't see this death to life thing as a reality. They saw it as as a symbol, as a metaphor for their country, for their people. That's why Peter, it says, when he left the tomb, he was perplexed, he was puzzled, he was confused. Because while Jesus had told them that he would die and raise again, they they didn't comprehend what the prophecies and the scriptures were really saying. They didn't really believe that this was going to be a physical death and resurrection. In fact, they thought they had lost their hope of their Messiah. They thought that once they had this land where they could live, that they would be living. They would be free. So a a crucified Messiah was not the Messiah they were searching for. These followers, these friends, this family of Jesus that showed up at the tomb were that. They They were friends. They were loved ones. They were family of Jesus the person. He'd not necessarily lived up to their expectations for a Messiah. They were confused. They were perplexed. They were puzzled, it says. It's interesting, right? Right after these events, we we see in Luke 24 that Jesus appears to two other followers. They were on the road to Emmaus. They were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They were on a 17-mile walk. And on this walk, they were pondering the events of the past three days. It says that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus who had left the tomb, walked up to them and they didn't recognize him. In Luke 24, verse 17, it says this, Jesus said to them, you seem to be in deep discussion about something. What are you talking about? So so sad and gloomy. They proceeded to explain to Jesus that, you know, this this man, Jesus of Nazareth, he was was a mighty prophet of God, that he had had performed all these miracles, and when he spoke, it had such power, and people were drawn to him. But lately, they explained that the high priest and the rulers of the people, they, they had crucified Jesus three days ago. And then earlier that morning, some women had gone to the tomb and Jesus' body wasn't there and that angels had said he was alive and they were confused by this. And Jesus is listening as they explain this to him. And in verse 25, he said to them, why are you so thick-headed? Why do you find it so hard to believe every word the prophets have spoken? Wasn't it necessary for Christ, the Messiah, to experience all these sufferings, and then afterward to enter into his glory. Then it says he carefully unveiled to them the revelation of himself throughout Scripture. He started from the beginning and explained the writings of Moses and all the prophets, showing how they wrote of him and revealed the truth about himself. Scripture says that Jesus stayed with these men for dinner, that he he spent time with them, and he, he stayed there. And when he broke the bread 
and blessed it. Scripture says that their eyes were unveiled and they saw that it was Jesus sitting with them. And then he was gone. It's an interesting story where Jesus is walking with followers of his, friends of his, people who had done life with him. And they didn't understand scripture. They, they were not able to wrap their minds around what the prophets had said and how it all pointed to Jesus. This is one of the greatest unveiling of revelation of scripture, one of the greatest unpacking of scripture for for all of us, as Jesus says, why do you not believe all this? Let me show you from start to finish how these scriptures, these prophecies, they all point to me, to myself. This is, this, this is what the scripture was talking about. I am what the scripture was talking about. So, of course, when they heard this and when they realized it was Jesus, these disciples, these followers of Jesus, they, they ran to tell the other disciples. They ran to tell their friends what had just happened. I don't know, isn't it fascinating that those closest to Jesus, those that had walked with him, that had heard his teachings, that had witnessed his miracles, witnessed his life, they were they were still searching for just a better version of what they already had. They were, they were expectant of a life that was just better than what they had. They were, they were expectant of not being oppressed, but being into a place where they could live life as free people on land that was theirs. They were just looking for a better existence. Something they, they could say, see, see, see what I can do with the help of God? See what we can do with this Messiah that has led us into freedom? See, see the better works and the better life that we can have because of what he's given us to, to work with? But I think what Jesus is trying to explain and what we see in this incredible event and, and life-giving moment of resurrection is that God doesn't want us to live in this illusion of life or, or a better life. No, he, he wants to take us from this place of existence to a place of living. This place of, of just kind of doing things to a place of experiencing life. It, it reminds me where this all began. As Jesus walks with these men back through the scriptures... From the beginning, it says that he unveils to them revelation of himself, revelation of the life throughout Scripture. You see, back at the beginning, after God the Creator had unveiled his creativity, he had created all the beauties of earth, the, the flying, beautiful things of the air, the, the fish of the sea, the mountains, the flowers. He'd created all of this. He'd shown his creativity. It says that he took dust and he mixed it and he formed it into his image. And then he breathed his life into it. Scripture says that he looked at his creation and said it was good. He says that man, that human, became a living being. Isn't that obvious? Like he created all of these things, but when he created man, he says this is a living being because he had breathed his life into it. But throughout scripture and throughout the Old Testament and into the gospels, we, we see that from the garden... God gave us a choice. In the garden, God gave Adam a choice of life, the tree of life, and a choice of curse, the knowledge of good and evil. A choice of life or a choice of existence where you, you know good and evil, you decide what is good and evil, where you exist 
outside of life. But the choice of life and death is kind of hard for us to kind of wrap our minds around because obviously Adam in that moment didn't physically die. It's almost like it's a choice of life or a choice of existence. It's this, this intersection where God takes us, where we, we come to this place of a choice between life and existence, a choice of life and death. Like I said, it, it doesn't really make sense. Like it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around because death looks like non-existence. Death looks like nothing. Death looks like just sedentary, doing nothing, just being there. But when we see things through the lens of Jesus and what he's talking about as he describes Scripture, when we have the revelation of Scripture through the lens of Jesus, we see that when Paul says that we have gone from death to life in the person of Jesus, death really looks like we were existing and now we're living. You see, we, we didn't go from a physical death to a, to a physical life. We went from existing without life to living with the life. You see, in, in this idea of death, death, death looks like existence outside of the life of Christ. Death looks like fear and worry. Death, death looks like bitterness and envy. Death looks like jealousy and greed. Death looks like pride. Death looks like anger and hatred. Death looks like us versus them. We think death looks like stationary nothingness, but death looks like existence without God without the life of Christ. Death is what life looks like without love. Death is what life looks like without hope. Death is what life looks like without faith. Ultimately, death is what life looks like without Jesus. It was early in the morning on the first day of the week, three days after the crucifixion of Jesus, the women went to the tomb to anoint his body. When they arrived, the stone was moved away. The tomb was empty and the two men gleaming with light stood there and asked the women this question. What are you looking for? What do, you, what do you hope to find in, in your search for God? What if this is a question that, that God is asking us when we look at relationship with Jesus? When we look at stepping into life, what are you, what are you looking for? What are, you, what are you trying to prove? What, 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 are you, what are you trying to step into? Do you have something to prove? What are you looking for? I know that in this community, in the arsenal, there, there's some of us that have had faith and lost faith at some point in our life. I, I recently had a conversation with someone that said they were, they were an atheist, and they said, if Christianity was just about Jesus, and, and like it was like Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the character of Jesus, and how Jesus operated, I could get behind that. It's, it's all the other stuff that pushed me away. Hmm. It strikes me that there are those in this community that have been told that following Jesus is about a list of do's and don'ts. It's about how to have a better existence, how to be better at this existing or better at this life. Today, I think God 
wants to ask you innocently and lovingly, what are you looking for? Why, why do you search for the living among the dead? Well, heaven and, and the afterlife are things that are often taught in the church as the goal. Jesus says that he came to give us life and life abundantly. Jesus says that he brought heaven down to us, that he is the life here, now. Life that is love living through us. I think today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, as we celebrate the life of Christ, as we celebrate the living, that we get to see and step into and experience life that is love through us right now, right where we are, not something we wait for in the future, but something we get to experience and live in now. You see, Jesus didn't come to give us a new set of rules to follow or a better way of existence. In fact, he came to give us life and call us out of just existing. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. You know, the, the early followers of Jesus, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, the early followers of Jesus, it, it was kind of dangerous for them to be a follower of Jesus because they, they had killed him right? The, the, the government had killed him. So they were, it, it, was, it was scary, maybe threatening to be a follower of Jesus. So when they would come to each other and acknowledge that they were followers of Jesus, they would say these words. They'd say, he is risen. And a response would come as he is risen indeed. It's interesting that this group of people that had looked for hope from a Messiah that would lead them into a better existence came to embrace the fact that, no, Jesus wasn't calling us to better existence, but he is risen. He's given us life. They had realized that the risen Savior was where they had truly entered into life from death. It was in this moment in history that God, the God that is love, opened up that love for us to share with each other this life that he had breathed into us. You see, it was this moment that we returned to our original design that the creator had created us with his life breathed into us. We got to step into that moment. Jesus said, I, I've gone from life to death to life because death has no power over me. And now death has no power over you because you have received my life. In, in fact, Galatians 2.20 says that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I was crucified with Christ and he now lives in me and through me. I have received the life, so I don't have to just exist, but I get to live life to its fullest now. This isn't just about going somewhere after we physically die, but this is about much more than that. This is about living in love and, and sharing that love with each other. This is about allowing the God that is love to breathe his life into us and live his life through us so that we might show his love to those around us. In fact, Jesus, when he spoke to his disciples, said, they will know that you are my true disciples by the way that you love each other. Why? Because as my life lives through you, it is manifest, it's, it's shown as love. This, this was never about a set of rules. This was never about a set of behavior modification, of ways to do better, ways to exist better. 
That, that's, that, in fact, that's what the disciples, the followers of Jesus that walked with him, that's even what they thought it was about. Up until the moment they realized that he is risen, he is alive. And the, the calling to life is not moving to better circumstances or better existence, but the calling that, of life that he is giving us is stepping into real life where we get to experience the life and love of Jesus in and through us. You see, the the resurrection was the ultimate shift in the way that we experience life. It It was the returning point to where it all began, to God's breathed life into us, now living life through us. This... This idea that the resurrection of Jesus offers us life changes everything. For me, it it took me from a place of trying to prove myself to an angry God to getting to rest in the fact that he loves me. He cares about me. He wants to do life with me. In fact, he wants to be my life through me. Now, I don't have to prove myself to him because I, I've returned to who he created me to be. And now his love gets to be the currency of relationships around me. You know, we're, we're called from death to life in Jesus. What, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Are you looking for the living among the dead? Are you experiencing life to its fullest? Our soul family, it's this day, this Resurrection Sunday, that we're reminded that we've been called into freedom and into life with Christ. It's on this day that we get to step into love that he's shown for the whole world. On the day that he went to the cross and three days later resurrected to new life. It's on this day that we're reminded that love is the currency that we spend on those around us. So Arsenal, go share that love with the world today. Go live life because that is what you've been given. Go love well because it's truly who you were made to be. I love you, Arsenal. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy life day, happy happy love day, happy stepping into this reality that we are alive in Christ so that we might love like he loved. And what a, what a day in history that we get to celebrate and remember the day that we became alive and we didn't just exist. Have an incredible week. Go love well. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for hanging out today. We hope you have an awesome Easter. We hope you leave here feeling loved and encouraged. And just as you go and celebrate the resurrection of Christ today, just remember that we love you so, so much and and we do want to stay connected with you. Hey, don't forget, text us. We'd love to connect with you. And uh, maybe if you're still wanting, looking for something to watch, watch one one of these videos if you're on YouTube. So Arsenal family, we love you and we'll see you soon next Monday.